Late Wednesday night, heading into Thursday morning, I'm not sure many people were aware, the oil market in the United States during the early, or early morning hours, there was a bit of a flash crash in WTI. The benchmark for U.S. crude oil, in, uh, crude oil prices suddenly and abruptly collapsed by over $3 a barrel. At one point, according to Bloomberg's recounting of the uh, episode, about 3,000 contracts for the June 2023 maturity traded in a very short period of time, which created this air pocket, which pushed the price of crude oil, at least that, that particular contract in the front months, down to as low as $63.64, which is the lowest it had been since December 2021. Now, that doesn't mean that, does, that seems a little bit out of character given the fact that we're talking about renewed inflation transitory disinflation, a U.S. economy that seems to be resurgent and resilient. Yet here are oil prices not just going lower, but experiencing a severe liquidity problem. In fact, the, uh, the authors in, the, in the, uh, the, the media over at Bloomberg, when they were writing up this particular uh, episode in the, uh, in the WTI market, they, they had to admit that this was about liquidity. Which is what they said. They said the scale of the move will raise fresh concerns or questions about the health of liquidity in the market, particularly given the move was concentrating WTI while Brent remained insulated, not really all that much insulated. Thinner volumes and outside price, outsized price movements have been a key feature in commodities markets when elevated margins reduced activities. Now they have to throw in their thing about regulations and reduced margins when, if that was the case, then why don't we see these flash crashes in oil markets far more frequently? Instead, what we're looking at here is the third of the three fundamentals that are priced into the WTI futures market. Of course, the first two, everybody knows, we've got supply, we've got demand, perceptions of supply, perceptions of demand, but then also money and liquidity. So suddenly we've got liquidity problems in the crucial crude oil market. At the same time, we're also talking about what? Banking difficulties. So... While the mainstream and while the Federal Reserve and politicians all want to talk about Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic as outliers and anomalies, here's another anomaly, right, Mr. Stephen Van Meter? Jeff, this makes no sense. I mean, none whatsoever. I mean, we just heard from Fed Chair Powell that, hey, look, we're, we're, the soft landing looks to be pretty solid here. we got to raise rates because look at payrolls. I mean, there's the demand component right there. What have we been hearing from China? You know, massive imports of oil. So you think, hey, wait a minute, if they're importing a lot of oil, they must think there's a huge demand component. And what are we hearing from everyone else? Hey, there's going to be a second and a half rebound. The economy is strong. The labor market's good. The global economy is going to turn out round. So the notion, you know, what, what we should perceive this as to be if prices drop like $3, what we should see is a huge amount of buyers line. I mean, there should be so many buyers for this that if it dropped even a fraction of it, they should be so eager to buy it because what we're hearing here is a massive amount of demand. So we shouldn't see this air pocket at all, but yet we did. Not only do we see it in crude oil, it, again, it's, it's, it's no longer an outlier because we keep seeing these all over the place. And like you said, Steve, if demand was robust or at least perceived to be robust over the second half of the year, and maybe it is, maybe that's, that's still something that the market is perceiving, but something prevented market participants from going into, that, into the, those particular contracts on a Wednesday night into Thursday morning. Of course, re oil prices did rebound Thursday into Friday, but that's the fact that this happened at all is like the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic and Credit Suisse and all these. It's another one of these warning signs that says there is something going wrong deep inside the euro dollar system in terms of money and liquidity and the availability of those kinds of resources to do these basic economic and financial functions. And that's really the important point here. Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. And let, let's put this into a concept that I think all of us can understand. I mean, imagine you're down at a car dealership and you're looking at cars and maybe maybe you just are a fan and you want to go see the new model because you're excited about it. And maybe you're not planning on buying a car that day, but you're walking along and all of a sudden the sales manager walks out, slaps a sticker on one of the cars that shows a humongous price drop. And you look at them and you say, hey, what's going on? And they shrug their shoulders like, I don't know. 
Like all I know is the price just dropped and you're so excited because you're like, Hey, I wasn't going to buy it, but this is such a great deal. I, I mean, I could flip the car if I wanted at this price and you reach into your pocket and suddenly you find nothing. You can't get finance. You can't do anything. And yet there was that flash crash in auto price that no one could react to. And that's kind of what we're seeing here in the oil market. And that's what doesn't make sense because if it was such a great deal, then somebody would have snapped it up and run off of that car and bragged to all their friends and what a great deal they got. Yeah, if they could have, they would have, right? That's that's really the point here. Something was preventing them from doing that. That's really what every flash crash is, is that there's a problem in liquidity where you want to get into the market, you want to buy some of these bargain basement prices, but the liquidity provider says, I'm offline for whatever reason, and I'm not going to provide you with the funds to do that. And it's interesting you mentioned car dealerships and cars, because that's another piece of data that came out this week, which is, I think, something worth discussing, too, along these same lines of deflationary money becoming deflationary economy. I think most people remember one of the most emblematic aspects of the quote unquote inflationary period of the last couple of years was used car prices. Because there was so much difficulty in producing new cars, used cars values went through the roof. And it didn't matter what it was, as long as it was a relatively new low mileage model, prices went crazy. In fact, people began watching something that I don't think many people know exists, which is the Mannheim Used Vehicle Value Index, which tracks the prices of used cars that are sold at wholesale auctions throughout the country. And for a while there, the prices of used cars just went through the roof. And then, of course, in the middle of last year, demand weakens, money becomes a little bit tighter. The used car prices started to decline. But here's the thing. Used car prices then began to rebound into the, second, into the last couple months of last year into the beginning of this year. And according to the Mannheim Used Vehicle Value Index, it was down about 0.3% in November, but then positive 0.8%. This is month over month in December, then up 2.5% in January and up 4.3% in February. And along with the CPI and the retail sales number and the January payroll numbers, the used car price index here made it seem like the U.S. economy was not just, it was, it was rebounding, maybe not even just rebounding, soft landing, no landing, and all that stuff. But here's the thing, used car prices since February have decelerated and are now contracting again. So according to the Mannheim Used Vehicle Value Index, in March, the price increase was down to 1.5% from 4.3, big turnover there. And then in April, just the, the, late, the latest data that just came out, minus 3%. So used car prices at wholesale auction are falling again. So here's the question, Steve. Let's assume that the economy was rebounding to start this year. Does this suggest that maybe even if it was rebounding, all that banking difficulty, that not Silicon Valley Bank and everything else in March and February, maybe that's having an impact already? Yeah, Jeff, I mean, we could make that case. I mean, you, you said that, you know, during the banking crisis that, hey, t hold on. If you think you're going to see a reaction here, it's going to hit the economy with a lag. It would make sense. If I'm out trying to buy a car and banks are literally like, you know, having liquidity issues and failing and I'm trying to get a loan. Well, they're, they're too busy dealing with the fact that they're an imminent failure to try to perhaps lend me some money. So it would make sense that we do see a drop in price. The question is, is this drop transitory, borrowing our favorite term from our Fed governors, or is it just part of that broader slowdown that we're seeing in the rest of the economy? That's a question we don't know the answer to just yet, but I suspect in the months to come, we're gonna find out and perhaps maybe even see some validation as we look to other parts of the economy that, yeah, the whole thing is really slowing down here. And that blip in car prices, it's just as you've always said, is the data doesn't go straight up or straight down. It kind of has a jagged path. And so perhaps this is just one of those moves. We'll see soon enough. Well, we did get, we get the uh, statistics on consumer credit this week. And the consumer credit for revolving credit, that went way up, which suggests that maybe uh, consumers are maybe a one last hurrah, uh, trying to get as, use as much credit cards because maybe they're forced to. But consistent with what we're seeing in the used car market and used car prices, non-revolving consumer credit was weak, unusually weak again for, I think, the third straight month. But we do have some other data that suggests at the other end of the spectrum that maybe the situation globally is falling off and decelerating, maybe even 
crashing a little bit faster than we had anticipated because we said, you know, we would expect there'd be a lag between all this banking stuff. But then again, the economy was weak heading into it. So the, the danger was always that the weak economy combined with banking difficulties would lead to some of the worst cases. And we've seen quite a lot of the worst cases in a country like Germany. Now, Germany is an important country to watch. Just, I mean, we have no, enormous sympathy to the Germans out there, but it's also a bellwether economy that tells us a lot about what we should expect around the rest of the world. Though we better hope this time is really different. And that's not the case because the data that came out of Germany just this week was, uh, I, Steve, do you have a word for it? I mean, it was just incredible, right? Yeah, it, it, was, it was shockingly terrible. I mean, we're here, we're talking about air pockets at the beginning of the show. And if we're going to talk about air pockets, you would think, okay, there's a little one here. There's a little one there. You wouldn't expect an entire country's economy to effectively see and in, in a massive air pocket underneath it. And, and that's what we saw in Germany, which is interesting because we will be talking about cars. We know they're a big manufacturing base in Europe. And as you said, Jeff, you know, Germany is so critical in the European Union. If a slowdown impacts them, you know, just like we talked about the banking crisis kind of floating out, you know, over the months that follow, which I think you'll agree, we haven't even seen the, the collateral damage from that yet in the economy. The same is true in the European Union. If Germany sees a slowdown, watch out because in the months that follow, the rest of the countries are likely to see it. I know you've got the data. Just just hit it with me. It's, it's bad, but let, let's hear it. Yeah, we're not talking about slowdown here. We're talking about something much more substantial than that. And it began with retail trade and retail sales. Those are down 2.4% month over month in the month of March, which is, you remember, that's when the banking difficulties hit. They were down 1.3% in nominal terms, which meant Germans are no longer spending nominally to cushion the blow. The real bad stuff came in terms of trade. Uh, exports were down 5.2%. That was in the month of March compared to February. So month over month, minus 5% in exports by value. That's an enormous decline. And somehow it was worse in imports, minus 6.4% month over month, continuing a massive decline of imports into Germany, both in real terms. And really, when you look at the volume numbers in terms of German trade, they're just alarmingly bad. Uh, the levels of volume being traded in and out of Germany are about comparable to, to the worst levels of 2008. I don't mean levels, I, mean, I don't mean month to month crashes. I mean levels as the same as the worst parts of 2008, even though we're 15 years later. That's the level of indicated trade into and out of Germany. And the latest, uh, latest figures we got estimates from Germany's factory sector on Friday, factory orders were down 10.7%, not year over year, just in March from February. Now there was some volatility in terms of large-scale orders and aircraft orders. But when you remove the large-scale orders, the month-over-month -month decline was much better, minus 7.7%. So while that's better than minus 10.7, minus 7.7% is still, that's equivalent to, say, August of 2021, when Germany was completely locked down by COVID. But this time, as you probably realize, Steve, there is no lockdowns. There is no pandemic. And we're getting numbers that are like 2020 and 2020 or 2008 here. These are these are pretty bad March numbers. Yeah. And you tack that on top of the manufacturing PMI coming out of Germany, 44.7 then for March. But look, or, I'm sorry, April. But you look at the uh, services side, it was up at 56. So you see this kind of bipolar economy. We see that throughout the global economy. But what I want to stress to people, if you're seeing an expansion in trade, you know, that's one of the key indicators. If you start to see, you know, commerce moving between countries, you see, you know, container volume start to increase. These are the things that you look for to say, hey, you know what? There is potential recovery here. So when you see a big decline in a manufacturing base, I mean, if you have a if you have a business, right? If you have just say you have your own business and you see a seven percent drop off, I mean, let's just say we strip out the really bad stuff, right, Jeff? And we just see a seven percent drop in your business in one month, you have a serious problem. Now you take that to the manufacturing base of the European Union, and you have to look at this and say, God, we hope this is an air pocket because if it's not, then we have some serious problems. Of course, we've been talking about deflationary money. You want to see a sign of it? There's one right there. Especially since the factory order data from Germany 
included um, most of the decline or, or not most, a big chunk of that decline came from outside of Europe, uh, outside the Eurozone. Factory orders from abroad outside Europe were down almost 15% on the month, which means America, Japan, China, China's reopening. One of the one of the things that we've talked about quite a bit, China's reopening is supposed to be this engine of growth, the way forward for the global economy to escape all of this recession talk, all the bad possible scenarios. And here, again, this is why we pay attention to Germany. The Germans are saying orders from China went way down because China is experiencing those problems too. And I know, Steve, you always follow not just Germany, but also South Korea. So the Chinese... Chinese, sorry, Steve, the Chinese are having enormous problems with external demand. And as you always say, global trade goes first. The goods economy goes first. It's not just about trade. It's not just about goods. It's about relative demand levels. And if trade is falling off, manufacturing is falling off, that's not just a problem for manufacturers. It's going to be a problem for service providers. Yeah, absolutely, Jeff. You mentioned South Korea, big exporter, their key place to watch. Um, they have exports, not just to the U.S., all over the world, like you said, particularly to China. And there was a steep drop off in their exports to China. And this is coming at a time when everyone's looking. I mean, this is weird. You know, the whole world's like suddenly, hey, China, can you help us out here? I mean, it's kind of weird that we're looking at them that way. And China, of course, is never going to answer that question. But we look at the data I mean, we can't look at their internal data as clearly, but we look at the external going into China. We go like, ah, there's no, there's nothing they're going to do to pull us out of this uh, uh, slump that we're facing. In fact, maybe then it tells us that things are far worse underneath than we think. And that is a pretty scary situation because if China can't do it and we all need them to, then what happens next? We haven't seen it show up really strongly in the U.S. data. I have a hunch, Jeff, that we're going to be able to see that within a couple of months. But you're right. The next factor is if you look at the factory sector, you see demand down. What do you need less of? Well, you need a lot less labor. And that is the problem. When labor starts to go, there's really no turning this back. Bringing this back to where we started, you also need, right, you also need a lot less oil. So if you need a lot less oil because there's a lot less trade, a lot less stuff being moved, a lot less goods, there's going to be a lot less need for services. And combine that with deflationary money, suddenly the oil market becomes another one of these outliers and anomalies that seem to be proliferating here. As always, Steve, thanks for your thoughts. We'll see you again next week. Jeff, always a pleasure. Look forward to it.